Our gospel reading that I chose for this morning, out of the several offered, shows Jesus in some of the early days of his ministry in Jerusalem at one of the festivals around which the Gospel of John is basically organized. Much of his message before this passage has been about the gifts of eternal food and drink, the food and drink of life. The experience of the woman at the well who asked for the living waters. And just preceding this passage, the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus sermonizes that this feeding was the bread of life and that he himself is the bread of life. Now, of course, to the untrained ears of the folks back then, this idea of eating a person's body was abhorrent. And his comment that he was the bread of life was one that caused division. Some people wanted to leave, and in fact, they did leave. Some of the disciples quit. Some of the crowd was impressed. But Jesus had to ask his own disciples, what do you think? Do you want to leave me? And of course, Peter, the one who gives the answer, said, well, where else would we go? But through all this, through his ministry and his preaching, enemies came to the front. And when, just before this passage, it was time to go to Jerusalem for the next festival, his family was worried, was fearful. In fact, Jesus sent them on ahead of him before he came, not as the final entrance into Jerusalem with a great parade, but Jesus alone came to the temple where he began to preach and where this lesson uh, took place. Jesus, of course, conquered any fear and he preaches at the temple about this living water. Well, varied events follow this and Jesus is about murder. People pick up stones ready to uh, take care of this blasphemy. The question is, is Jesus acceptable as the real Messiah? How does he measure up? So this incident at the temple with Jesus harks back to the Israelites in the wilderness where they must rely on God for food, in fact, must rely on God for everything. And in this passage from Numbers, they have hounded Moses simply to distraction. Their manna, which they harvest every day, is just not enough. Not tasty enough. Not varied enough. We're tired of it. And they're afraid of losing everything in this trip through the desert. They want meat. They wonder, can God really provide? You know, back in Egypt, they say, we had melons and leeks and garlic among all the good things of life in Egypt. Well, Moses makes his plea to God, as Moses often does, asks for help. And indeed, God will provide quails who, following the passage, come streaming in from the shore. But Moses says this ministry is just too much. And God allows that he should share the ministry. So 70 of the elders are gathered near the tent, and the Holy Spirit comes down and spreads among them. But as with many things, there is the fly in the ointment. Two others who were not near the tent, Eldad and Medad, are out there prophesying just like the ones who were chosen. 
people come running up, well, tattletales come running up and saying, look at them, look at what they're doing. And Aaron is ready to make them stop. But Moses says, no, no, let the spirit act. Let the spirit be in charge. If the spirit has filled them with the desire to preach, let them spread God's word. Well, of course, before and after this passage, uh, things are troubled for Israel. Their yearning for immediate gratification leads to the bad ends that they set up for themselves. And the Israelites heed this word of God that the Spirit has sent to those who have been gifted to prophesy. That's the question. That's the question that follows them now for 40 more years. So we come to the reading for Acts, our festival of Pentecost, which we as Christians celebrate today. It was a Jewish festival, the festival of the harvest, the festival of the giving of the law. But let's remember for the disciples what this festival was like for them. They abandoned Jesus at the cross. They hid in the small rooms. They left town to Emmaus or wherever. They were filled with fear. And this Pentecost celebration is ten days after Jesus' ascension, when Jesus, who, when he appears, fills them again with hope and gladness. But now they see that he is truly gone. Were his promises good for only the short time? Well, yes, the disciples have gone through the motions of keeping the faith, they replaced Judas. They found Matthias. They've kept together. And now there are something like 120 of them gathered in a small area for this festival. But what kind of festival atmosphere was it? Well, we have to believe that through all this time, Jesus' words, Jesus' ministry, Jesus' presence in the resurrection was working what we in the church recently, and maybe to our distress, would like to call a paradigm shift, they were finally getting it. They were finally realizing that it wasn't just Jesus' immediate presence in his bodily form that would lead them to the call to ministry, but it was his spirit that he had promised and promised and promised, and indeed, there it came rushing through them with great wind and with tongues of fire. From that point on, Peter begins to prophesy, begins to encourage the crowd. 3,000 end up being baptized that day. And from this fearful little bunch of followers in Jerusalem, we celebrate today as the Church of God. So fear was a part of all of these passages. Fear. Fear that was overcome by Jesus in his preaching. Fear that was overcome with the resurrection. Fear that the Israelites finally overcame as they took the promised land. And fear that the disciples overcame as the Holy Spirit empowered them. So today, today fears have led to our community breakdown. We see especially this week, once again, police fearful of those they confront. And of course, black men fearful for their lives. And of course, this is the season of fear. For months now, we have lived in fear of the virus. Our precious symbols have now even taken on a new meaning. 
that lovely hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God. Uh uh. And it only takes a spark to get a fire going. It all goes around and warm up and it's glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you want to sing. It feels like spring. You want to pass it on. This week, the fires and the sparks are burning, but not in a good way. What can we do about it here in Weezer, our quiet little town? As we see on our TVs, on our computer screens, or it can be put right in the middle of all that's going on around our nation. But what can we do about it? Yes, you as the community of St. Luke's Parish have been most generous, have empowered our friends at Ridley's and encouraged them in what may have been a scary time, empowered meals from the senior center, gas money for those who need transportation to doctor's appointments, and individually many acts of support and encouragement. Are we done now? Have we done our part? Today we are going to recite our baptismal liturgy. It's the outline of our faith. And so, once again, we know what we believe. We know, as the disciples did, they knew what they believed. They'd been hearing Jesus for days, for months, for the years of his ministry. Initially, what did they do about it? Again, they locked the doors. They hid in fear. They were waiting, waiting, waiting for what? So today, can we recapture that breath of God, that fire of the Holy Spirit? Can we turn the evil emanations of these things back into the good that God intends? Can we speak in tongues that refresh and comfort the way the Holy Comforter intends us to speak? Now in the other epistle reading for today, Paul outlines the many gifts that are given. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. And these gifts are given to every single one of us. Nobody goes without a gift. Our challenge is to seek the Holy Spirit's power, to recognize the Holy Spirit at work around us and in us, Power the gifts that God has given us for good. How can we raise our voices? How can our language be language that people can understand? And what is our message? Of course, if we've been listening, we know from our presiding bishop, our message is the voice of love. That's all there is to it. The voice of love. Now I know and Shauna can back me up. She has a saint that's in mind for me. I know sarcasm and anger are so easy, and we feel like we just must vent in these days. And of course, we need to stand up to injustice. We need to raise our voices in power to make this world a better place. But our voices must be voices of love. And can we even do that here from Little Weezer? Can we at least be a start for this turnaround to take back the good things that God has provided for us? Our baptismal covenant starts out by asking us to do things. Well, it starts out with our affirmation of faith. And then, what is it you're going to do about it? I like to turn the order around a little bit and remind us that, again, our basic 
covenant is that we spread the gospel. And what is the gospel? God has created this world good. God's kingdom is intended for good. All this that goes wrong is not the way it's supposed to be. And God's ultimate plan and power, power through his spirit, is that we will bring this world to the good place that God intends for it. Of course, we have to empower each other. That's why we gather. That's why we pray. That's why we read scripture. And not just in our own little hidden community, locked behind closed doors, but out in the world. Everybody, everybody is called with the Spirit. Everybody is gifted with God's power. And of course, seek justice. Rise up and call for justice. Without justice, God's world is taken over by evil. Finally, we must walk humbly. It's not all up to us. When we miss the mark, when we fail, when we feel like the Spirit is gone from us, repent. That's the word. Repent. Because in all these things, we will, with God's help. So brothers and sisters, rise up, ye saints of God, have done with lesser things, and quicken by the Spirit's power. Be serving the King of kings. Amen.